So the question is, why are we here? And it's why did we have a 10-day conference, and why did we decide to ask these people who are incredibly busy, have tremendous amounts of commitments, and speak as keynote speakers to large crowds around the country and world to all come together on one stage at the same time, when in reality, each of them can probably answer the questions alone. There's no real reason to have all four of them when they each are capable. And the reason is there's a huge issue that I'm finding in my research that the reality of what people are believing, saying, and thinking seems to be very different than what I'm reading. So I am, have no medical background of any kind, no nutrition background. I'm a, just a random person who reads articles for this website that I've been working on. And I keep reading again and again about whether or not some of the drugs work and what the side effects are. And smoking is a very big issue, but we're not talking about it at this conference because you all understand smoking. The reason I feel it is so important to bring these people here and to have this subject is most people in the United States, probably the world, are being told very clearly, if you are sick, this is what you do. You go to the doctor, you take the medicine, whatever they say, take. And if you even see some good ones on TV, suggest those to the doctor. And the country is believing that these are very beneficial with minimal side effects. Now, I don't actually know what the truth is. I'm not here to say anything adverse about anything because I don't really know, but I am saying that constantly I'm reading articles and articles. Now, one thing that's particularly disturbing is the number one and two pharmaceutical drugs in the world are the antidepressants and the statin drugs. And I've read a lot of information saying that they're not performing according to the way they're supposed to, or they don't have the same, the benefit that they say, and that they have these side effects. So it gets me wondering, what do we really know about this? Do, you know, we just assume, we go to the doctor's office, he says, take this, and we take it. And I have a lot of friends who are quite smart, and they are on lots of medication. And so I thought it would be a good idea to bring people who have studied this subject, have detailed, extensive knowledge, to just let us know. We already know about cigarettes. We know about sugar. But when it comes to the subject of drugs, we pretty much assume we already we assume everything's good. So I would like to ask these people to help clarify for all of us what is the reality about this so that we don't in 25 years find out if, if the information exists today, we'd like to learn it today, not wait 20 more years. So I'd like to open it up if maybe each of you could maybe introduce yourself and maybe give me just opening thoughts of why you wrote books on this subject, why you speak about this subject, why you research this subject, and just where you're at on this subject in general as an opening. Well, initially, um, I left the pharmaceutical industry in the year 2000, and I had no intention of being a whistleblower or writing a book or discussing any of it with anyone because it was a nightmare experience by the time I was out of it. And I just wanted to turn my back and walk away. But I had a niece who was 20 years old, and she was taking antidepressants, and she committed suicide by burning herself alive. And it happened to be that at that time, I was doing research to write a book about the blockbuster drugs that had been out and that had been pulled off of the market. And so I myself had run across an extensive amount of information about the inefficacy of antidepressants, about the dangers, about how all of this information had been revealed initially in the clinical trials, because I had been trained how to read clinical trials. So once I got into the information, I was devastated at the, the amount of disinformation and misinformation that had been presented to the public. So I felt like because of what had happened to my niece and because she had received a mental illness label and it had destroyed her precious, wonderful life, I chose to speak out um, on her behalf to let other people know what had happened to her and to save other families from that, that same kind of uh, trauma and distress that I had experienced from that. So um, in doing so, I think that I have really picked up uh, an area that a lot of people have ignored and that is from coming from the inside to let people know what pharma is doing to people. I'm Irvin Kirsch, and heard a little about me from our. Do you need a microphone? 
Are we on? I'm on. No, 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 there you go. no, no this yeah, is working now. now. Thank you. Yes, yes. So now I am Irving Kirsch. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my story is not as dramatic as Gwen's, but has some similarities. I uh, was a professor of psychology at that time at the University of Connecticut and a practicing psychotherapist as well. And being a psychologist, I couldn't prescribe medications, but occasionally when I would have a very depressed client, I would refer the client to a psychiatric colleague to get a prescription for antidepressants. I assumed they worked just like everyone else knew that they uh, worked. Um, my area of research was the placebo effect and decided to look at the placebo effect in, on depression just because it seemed to me there ought to be a placebo effect on depression since hopelessness is such a central feature of depression and promise of treatment should instill hope. And in doing that, I encountered the drug data and saw what the difference between the drug and the placebo in the clinical trials was and was blown away because the difference turned out to be negligible. Nothing that would make any real difference in anybody's life began shifting the focus of much of my research. Still do a lot of research on placebos, but also now do research on the efficacy and inefficacy of uh, antidepressants in the treatment of depressive disorders and, and, uh, and anxiety. My name is Gabriel Cousins. I'm trained as a psychiatrist, uh, and my experience is primarily clinical. Coming out of Amherst College, I had already written a, a, a published paper on biochemistry and biophysics, and really was very interested in the biochemical aspects of this. In my first year of uh, psychiatry residency, I actually got really into it. I had extremely good mentors. Uh, Jonathan Coles, the past director of the National Institute of Mental Health. El Damasio, head of uh, really mental health uh, drug part for the state of Massachusetts. And Hal Goldberg, these are all people who have done really good research. These are personal friends and mentors. And actually, after the first year, I began teaching the first level course in psychotherapy and in, in, in psychopharmacy. So that's interesting. But I learned pretty quickly. Give me two years, I've got to figure it out. And this was, I, I saw clearly there, there was huge problems. Um, and the people I'm working with actually understood that too. Like Jonathan Coles and uh, Dr. Teicher actually came to the FDA and said, you know, our research is showing you've got three times more suicide with the SSRIs. They didn't want to hear that. But they actually did it. So I was with a good group of people. One of the interesting things is something you may not have heard of called tardive dyskinesia. How many people have ever heard of that? So if you're on these drugs, the antipsychotic drugs, for too long, it's an irreversible thing. When I heard that, I said, I've got to take people off all this. Well, the research is interesting is that only 50% of people kind of relapse. I took a whole ward off, and there were, all the nurses were all upset. And, you know. But that's what we did. I had the backing, and it worked. And after that, it's like, well, we, we should not put people on, but at least we can take them off. In my evolution, uh, within a year or two after my psychiatry residency, I went into more holistic medicine and actually and was and still am involved in uh, orthomolecular psychiatry, which is a whole different paradigm, which is you rebuild the neurotransmitter systems and brain function. And we get some pretty good results, 90% results with depression and at least 50% with people who are psychotic. That's very, uh, really positive. So. And then I do a lot of work in taking people off these. And that's a whole problem, which I'll probably discuss a little bit later in the session. But once people are on, it's really difficult. Not they're addicted, but and this is the key concept. 1996, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Hyman, head of the National Institute of Mental Health, said, I know how this works. And the answer is, they cause perturbations in the neurotransmitter systems. And further down the line, we see irreversible, fairly irreversible perturbations, and also worse, changes in brain structure, the basic, basic ganglion, the cortical structures. It's wow. So even at the NIMH level, people understood this as far back as 1996. So if we just kind of get the idea these cause serious perturbations, that's a first step. Second step is, we'll talk about as we get in, is the progression of where that takes you. So that's what I'm about, is more about getting people off these from a cl clinician's point of view and providing far more successful natural ways to rebuild the brain. You know, just listening to the first three, it's interesting. Everyone really came from a pretty conventional point of view initially and moved away from that conventional point of view, which I think is noteworthy. Um, by the way, Abram Hoffer's work on orthomolecular psychiatry, he, I think it was in the 60s, he published some information about the use of B vitamins as a treatment for psychosis but there's no profit structure in B vitamins, and he was pretty much ignored uh, the rest of his life, I mean, for 30 years, which is an example of why do, we know, why do we hear what we hear? Well, when you have something successful coming out of a nonprofit arm, it just doesn't get publicized. And just to add one other thing, he was mentioning when Jonathan Cole and Martin, T is it Tyker or Teicher? So they did studies in the early 90s that showed that uh, indeed, SSRIs, Prozac, could increase, they could, in, they could stir suicidal and homicidal ideation in people who'd never had it before. And eventually then the FDA holds a hearing on that. Now, you have to understand, Jonathan Cole was one of the premier figures in the development of American psychopharmacology. So he's up on a pedestal. But when they had this hearing, if, and tell me if I'm wrong, they did not allow him to speak. No, that's exactly right. They didn't want to hear what his research showed. So the FDA is convening a hearing on the risk of suicide in, with SSRIs. They have a study done by two of the premier researchers, including the former head of the Psychopharmacology Service Center at the NIMH, for years. The guy who's studying the assessing these drugs, and he's ready to step forward saying, we have a problem with the SSRIs and they don't let him testify, which sort of goes to what you're talking about, how do we know what we know? So real quickly, just, uh, and I uh, alluded to this when my own background, so I actually left daily newspaper reporting in 1994, I think it was, and I became director of publications at Harvard Medical School, which is about as mainstream of a position as you can have. And at that time, uh, we were, what was hammered into us, this idea of evidence-based medicine was really coming up. And so the idea was with evidence-based medicine was doctors could become, they can be deluded by what they see, and you have to look at the science to see if these, these therapies are really effective. So that was one mainstream value that I really incorporated. And then I actually started a publishing company that focused on the development of new drugs. And it was a pretty industry-friendly news uh, publication. We had a weekly newsletter, a monthly newsletter. And the framework for that publication, it was called Sensor Watch, was as drugs move into clinical trials, this is part of the progress of medicine, and it's even good for people to volunteer for those trials because you can get access to great therapies before they come on the market. <laughs> so very, very actually pro-industry. And going to this is what I found though, however, while doing reporting for that thing about the development of new drugs, is that even before they began like their big phase two or phase three tests, so in order to get a drug on market, you first do a, a phase one safety, first you do animal studies, then you do a phase one safety study, then you do a smaller study in phase two, and if you pass phase two, you do a big phase three safety and efficacy. It sounds like a scientific process, right? Well, what I, it came, I came to understand was that as the drug companies were designing their trials, 
even before phase two, they would bring in the marketing people, especially with psychiatric drugs, and they would say to the marketing people, what story do we need to tell from our studies? In other words, what story will emerge from these studies that will allow our drug to be successful in the market? So, in other words, rather than a scientific exercise designed to really assess the safety and efficacy, the clinical testing became a marketing exercise, mm -hmm. looking to produce results that would prepare for a successful launch for that drug. And then, just to give you an example of this, to sort of launch this, if you go back to the first generation antipsychotics, um, they cause Parkinsonian symptoms, they cause tardive dyskinesia, all these bad side effects, right? So as drug companies like Janssen was bringing a drug called Risperdal to the market, what story did they want to tell? Well, they wanted to tell, among other things, that their drugs didn't cause Parkinsonian symptoms and didn't cause tardive dyskinesia. In other words, it had a better side effect profile. So what did they do when they designed the trials? What they did is they designed trials where they would have three doses of Risperdal, a low dose, a medium dose, and a, a more regular dose, and then they would compare it to a really high dose of Haldol. Now, Haldol is known to cause a lot of side effects, and then they would publish papers that compared side effect profiles of Risperdal at a low dose to the side effect profile of the high dose of Haldol and say, look how much safer our drug is. And the point is that wasn't an accident. It was designed to be able to tell a story about how Risperdal was so much safer than Haldol. And then once the drug got on the market and they compared Risperdal, the new expensive drug, to Haldol at the same dosages, they found out there was no benefit with Risperdal. So my point is, this is when I sort of had the scales fall from my eyes and see that what I thought was a scientific enterprise was really a marketing enterprise. And I love science. I mean, I think science is a, the scientific mind is a precious thing. It does illuminate so many things, and to see science perverted in this way was really upsetting to me. Mm. And anyway, that was in 1990s, and then I had no interest in psychiatry whatsoever, to be honest with you, but I eventually stumbled into it, and if you want to find any area of medicine where there's such a discrepancy between the science and what the public is told, it's in this area. And now I'm convinced that, again in psychiatry, and it comes a little bit out of this newest book, is, you know, our society has organized itself around a false narrative in terms mm -hmm. of psychiatric problems. And that narrative also tells us a lot about, our, it gives us a, a false philosophy of being, you know what I mean? That your brain has these things and that's what makes you like this takes away self-responsibility, so the reason I sort of stick with this is I think it's really harming our society in a very, very profound way, and it's certainly harming how we raise our children mm -hmm. in this sort of pathologized environment. So. Let me just tell you reality for a lot of people who do not study the subjects, who do not read books, who do not come to conferences. Reality for a lot of people is it's 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, they're watching the TV, commercial comes on, really attractive woman, an attractive man, they're happy, they're on the beach, they got a dog, there's a kid nearby, a slogan comes on that says live your life to the fullest, don't let anything hold you back, and it talks about some drug. Um, you know that we live in a country where we have the FDA to protect us, to make sure everything is safe and can't hurt us. You go to your doctor who says, yes, this is what I recommend, take it. Um, and you're told that you, know, that, you know, you don't know about medicine, you weren't trained in it, you should definitely take this if you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, if you have gout, if you have all these different things. And it seems pretty good. And you ask your friends, and your friends say, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. You're, you know, you're 50. This is what happens to people. You're getting older. And, you know, this is good, and we have the best medicine in the world, and we have protection from the government agencies. So what's different about this? This is what a lot of us think. So in your opinion, how, what, do, what do you think reality is? Because that's the reality that a lot of people have. What's, what's really going on, in your opinion? Well... I'll just share some research that's really came out of his book, but it's excellent research, and so I don't mind taking it. Um, <laughs> when we look at <coughs> antipsychotics, antidepressants, and anti-anxieties, there's a consistent pattern that unfolds. 
In the short term, they may look a little better. You give somebody Haldol in an acute psychosis and give them a day or two and it's going to help. However, go a few weeks and a few months down the line, then you're looking at getting it worse. The same thing, and, and particularly one year uh, a relapse. So, and the same thing holds true with the antidepressants and really anti-anxieties. For example, Xanax was uh, uh, researched pretty extensively. First four weeks, it's good, you're getting some relief. Eight weeks, break even. 23 weeks, oh, you're worse. Now what I mean by worse means you're having more anxiety, more panic attacks, and if you withdraw from it, you got four times more panic attacks and considerably more anxiety, worse than when you started. The pattern is worth understanding. Now I'm going to go back to antipsychotics for a moment. The research generally, and some of this was done by Jonathan Coles and other you know, very, very high-ranking people, is the longer you're on it, the worse it is because there's more brain deterioration, particularly in the basal ganglion. And the higher the dose you're on it, the more relapse. And some of the re research was done with the uh, early one, Thorazine, and it's like, fine, you, you, you're at 300 milligrams, you're gonna have a 13% uh, uh, relapse, and then you go a little higher, 500, and you're up to 21, 23% relapse, and then you go higher and you're, you know, a much higher relapse. But what are we really saying? And it's also true with the antidepressants, although antidepressants have another problem, which is well described, which is they move you into the next level of, of uh, mental breakdown. Well, what, what am I saying there? I'm saying people who get on antidepressants they have, uh, who are just depressed, okay? And next thing you know, there's a high percentage that are converting to manic depression. Oh, now manic depression means you get put on the antipsychotics, and the next thing you know, you are chronically disabled. And that, so you see a flow of chronic degeneration with very little results. And in fact, uh, the research with the antipsychotics shows that after uh, a year, although it helps in the first little bit, there's a m much more relapse we call it five-year relapse and so forth, or three-year relapse, than if you don't take any medication. Well, that's an important statement, that people actually do better not having medication. And that's there, it's in the journals, it's in the National Institute of Mental Health Research, high-level research. So I'm going to say it again. People actually do better in really short-term and long-term results if you do not take the antipsychotics because they do interfere, sometimes somewhat irreversibly, with your brain structure. I won't, I'm not going to go into the biochemistry of it, but that's what we're talking about. And that is a serious problem. And it happens with all of these. And the withdrawal can cause even worse effects. So that's three levels where we, we're using drugs regularly. So I think that's part of the more serious element of it. But to me, the bigger element that's more serious isn't all the, the fact that they don't work. Ah, and they make things worse. Got to count that in there. Not that they just not work. You're causing harm. As physicians, you're not supposed to harm people. Okay. Now, the next thing is it's a whole attitude in society. Got a po problem? Pop a pill. Don't change your life. Don't look at how you can grow spiritually. Don't ask any questions about your soul evolution. Just try to put, you know, suppress the symptom. So it's an anti-evolution, from a spiritual point of view, type of situation. And that's going on now at, 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 at uh, parents are busy, they're so busy working, and I want to honor the parents with that. It's like, oh, there's no diagnosis of manic depression for kids. That's legitimate, if you get what I'm trying to say. It's just an opinion. Is it ADD? Is it manic depressive? Is it just a normal kid a little bit active? They don't actually have, uh, let's say, a real test for any of that. So it's very subjective and the parent is kind of worn out. Hey, uh, you know, I'm busy working. I just can't deal with this. 
let's pop a pill, it's taken care of. It's not my responsibility. It doesn't matter what kind of diet I'm giving them. It does, nothing matters. It's just take a pill. It's a, 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 you know, a congenital physiological defect. It's just not true. So we take hyperactivity and all those altered brain states, and what we see is it's really accelerated by poor diet, high sugar diet, and all the other toxins that are going on, including now we're going to add radiation from all the kids being exposed. And 75%, the research is showing, is treatable with proper nutrition and lifestyle changes. If you're getting a little fancy, Joe Furman and myself both are, are talking 90% success rate with this kind of thing with a full attention. I may mean, give people homeopathy, we do this, we do that. You get really good results at night, you know, and, and so what's the problem? The problem is where are people at? I don't want to just blame the doctors, in other words. I want, to, I want the society to begin to reflect on that and what's coming out of that and the parents and the school system. Hey, this kid's a little active. Uh, let's put them on. They're too active. Uh, let's not bother the teacher. Let's just take care of it. And this is a very, very serious problem. And as uh, one uh, doctor uh, in the, there's a whole book that kind of has all the symptoms in it. And Robert Spitzer was like the first. I actually knew him at Columbia. And, but the second person and head of that, uh, Francis, okay, saying something very interesting. You know, he's saying, I regret what's going on. He's saying the border between normality and manic depressive has started to disappear. And I'm actually thinking, I don't want to misquote him, but thinking that I'm doing, uh, this has done, the DMS uh, 3 or 4 has done some real harm because you're categorizing people even with normal development and putting them on drugs that ultimately create brain changes in the children. We don't even know what that's going to look like. This is really bad news. So there's a lot of, of, of kind of collusion in the whole thing. So those are my, my concerns is a society that says, oh, let's make everybody the same. Anybody's out of line, they need a drug. So this is the kind of issues that are going on. Now, I thought it was interesting that Francis actually said that. He, he actually said, if people, if kids are a little out of line, you know, he didn't use those words, uh, but slightly unique, they're more likely to get on a drug because we have a society, society everybody wants to be normative. And that's what's happening to our society, which is not necessarily no, awakened normality, put it that way. So those are kind of an overview insight that I, I want to share. I'm just going to... Go, go, go. I just want to follow on a couple of things, going back to what Steve was saying and then what Dr. Cousins was saying. So one of the truisms that we know in society today is that everybody with schizophrenia should be on antipsychotics for life, okay? That's, we have laws organized to that idea. We have forced outpatient treatment laws, and that's considered an absolute fact. So three quick facts that you don't hear about, even while you're getting these commercials. One, you know John Nash died uh, on Saturday. Do you all know John Nash, a beautiful mind? Mm -hmm. So he died on Saturday. Now, do you remember the movie? Yes. What does Russell Crowe say before he's going to get the Nobel Prize? He says, I'm better now because of the newer medications. Okay, that's what he says. Do you know what really happened? John Nash refused medication starting in 1970. What's that? Yes, in 1970, once he got out of his last hospitalization, actually he refused it all the time when he got out of the hospital in the 60s, but 1970 he stopped. And if you actually read the biography, it says... It's good that he stopped because otherwise, because of the effects, including tardive dyskinesia, these drugs and the mental fog they produced, he would have never returned to work. So the truth was, he stopped. It was probably why he was able to return to work. And you know what Americans were told in the movie, because we get our, is that the newer medications was what enabled him to recover. Now that's an example of the perversion of truth that becomes so problematic. Now, how did that get in the script? Well, the scriptwriter's mother was a psychiatrist, that's number one. 
But two, I think the PR firms that work for the drug uh, industry worked with the script writer because there was an article about how they had got that line planted in the, in the movie. And then when the movie came out, drug reps like Gwen, I don't know if you did this in the United States and Canada, they handed out free tickets to the movie, didn't you? Yeah, I sold Haldol. Yeah, okay, so they handed out free tickets because it supported the, the belief in this. So that's one bit of information. Two, I'll give you another bit of information. This goes back to something Dr. Cousins just said. The best long-term study of uh, outcomes for schizophrenia patients that's ever been done in the United States has been done by Martin Harrow at the University of Illinois. He followed 200 patients starting back in the late 1970s. 15 years later, he had 145 patients still in his study. That's very good to keep 77% of your, quote, schizophrenia patients, psychotic patients. Just naturalistic, he follows them. Everyone treated with drugs in the hospital, then he follows them at two years, four and a half, seven and a half, 10, 15, and 20. And here's what he found. At the end of two years, those who had come off were not really doing any better than those who were on. It was very close. And both were still showing a lot of pathology. But between years two and four and a half, those who got off meds did a lot of recovery. They got a lot of better on a lot of domains. Psychotic symptoms abated. Many went back to work. Anxiety symptoms abated, such that by the end of four and a half years, the recovery rate for those off medication was 40%. That meant they were working or back in school, asymptomatic, and had no psychotic symptoms. For those on medications, it was 5%, an eight-fold higher recovery rate. Now, that stayed through 15 and 20 years. And how about psychotic symptoms? At the end of those who stayed regularly on the medication, 75% were still actively psychotic at, at years 10, 15, and 20. Those off medication, and particularly those who, who got off and stayed off, only about 25% still had psychotic symptoms. 87% of those who got off by year two and stayed were working and back in school and stuff, many, fairly regularly during that time. Virtually no one on drugs worked. Okay, now all of you who've read that in your local Orlando newspaper, the results of that study, please raise your hand. <laughs> Come on, that's the best long-term study we've had of schizophrenia outcomes. How come you didn't read about it? You know what Martin Harrow said in 2008 when he went to the American Psychiatric Association meeting? I conclude that, that those off antipsychotic medication long-term psychotic patients have significantly better global outcomes. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you hear this? I'm asking you. Let's say the re results were the reverse and 40% of on drugs uh, were in recovery versus 5% off. Would that have made news? Mm -hmm. Front page. This is a problem, it's an information flow problem we have too around this, is that when outcomes like this go that really upset uh, conventional wisdom, we don't hear about it. And by the way, the psychiatric residents, if you look at their textbook, it doesn't incorporate that study correctly into the psychiatric textbook as well. This perversion even extends as well to there. Anyway, this is, when I hear about the uh, TV commercials, it's just propaganda, folks. <laughs> And the problem is, okay, it's propaganda, but these other stories, they also get suppressed when we have, and then we get, you get the Menash story that's changed, which is very, you know, was very symbolic. And then here we have the best long-term outcome study ever done of schizophrenia patients. And it's actually good news. Those off medication, they, there were psychotic symptoms were abating, more than half were working, Good social lives. You know what some of them became? There was like a lawyer. There were teachers. Now, those people who were diagnosed with schizophrenia and became lawyers and teachers, do you think they now say to their peers, you know, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia for five years. We don't hear about that, right? And so these disappear. This is why this is the very study we should be talking about and we should hearing about and that should help us guide our care. And finally, one other thing. You know where they get the best outcomes? for first episode psychotic patients in the world today, in the Western world? Northern Finland. You know what Northern Finland did? They have a form of care that really looks at psychotherapy and in increasing social interaction. It's called open dialogue therapy, and they minimize use of antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of their patients, five years out, have never been on antipsychotic medications, so they never get these brain changes. So given that this is the best results we see in the Western world, what should we be doing in the United States? Trying to pilot it, trying to copy it, right? Mm -hmm. But that doesn't get promoted. You don't read about that in your Orlando newspaper. 
So this is the problem, what you're getting at, is we have an information problem that makes it really difficult for our society to know about these drugs, their effects, what they do to the brain, et cetera. Can I add something to that? I'd just like to add that, that I sold Haldol, and I remember when I was first uh, being trained on Haldol, I asked my district manager during a training session, I said, you know, how many patients have we cured with Haldol? I mean, how many patients recover on Haldol? And he said, oh my goodness, hon, nobody recovers on these drugs. These patients don't recover. In fact, we have what's known as a revolving door syndrome, that each time that they come into the hospital for treatment, they go out with uh, a greater disability than they came in with. And so we don't look for cures, we just look to manage the symptoms of these individuals. And that's the reason why we're coming out with Haldol Decanoic, because so many people do not want to take their medications that we're going to now put them on board for 30 days so that we don't have to have them remember or take their own medications. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. When in studying the side effect profiles of these, some people really have serious reactions to Haldol. If you have it in a decanoid, how are they going to remove the drug when they have an adverse reaction? Well, we're really not concerned about that. We're just concerned about you need to convert your Haldol tablet sales now because that has gone off patent and now we have this new patent for this decanoid and so you need to get all of those sales converted into that, including your nursing home. And so I got a, a very crash course, you know, immediately in that we're not concerned about what happens in outcomes with patients. We're concerned about the bottom line of our drug portfolio, and that's what you need to be concerned about. So that was, a big, you know, my first aha moment, and there were numerous incidents like that to follow. So I really want you to be aware that from the inside, they're very well aware that these drugs don't work and they are keeping this information undercover for profit, pure and simple. I'd like to address both that issue and the issue that uh, Bob Whitaker raised. Um, and I can also attest that the drug companies uh, are very well aware of the data and how ineffective the drugs, and I'm talking about just one particular class of drugs right now, and that's antidepressants. So when, it, when you ask, about antipsychotics, I will defer <laughs> to my esteemed uh, panelists, and, and um, I think I know more about antipsychotics and, and the problems of antipsychotics from reading Bob Whitaker's book than I do from any other um, source. But I can address directly the issue of antidepressants, and I know I was contacted by two uh, pharmaceutical companies who asked me to come down and speak to them, and both of them told me the same thing. They said, well, we don't see why there's such a big fuss and controversy about your research, showing how small the difference is between antidepressant and placebo. We know that. We, we, we have trouble uh, showing significant differences between the drug and placebo, and in fact, what we'd like to do is find a way to more reliably detect who's likely to respond to placebo in a clinical trial and get them out of the trial so that we have a better chance of showing a difference between drug mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and placebo. And they were very forthright, frank, and open about um, uh, that. The media is an issue, and it's an important one, but it's not the only issue because I had a somewhat different experience with the antidepressant research. I got some excellent media coverage. Um, first meta-analyses I did got covered in the New York Times, it got covered in Newsweek, it got covered in USA Today, they were on it and came out with stories the day that it was published. They interviewed me before it was published, a press release had been sent out that the information w was embargoed until the study actually comes out, but they could prepare themselves uh, to publish it. In 2008, when uh, my research came out, uh, my second meta-analysis, its third meta-analysis, uh, with the FDA data, um, the British press jumped on it, and it wound up being the front page news in all of the major British newspapers. 
And then when my book was translated into English, uh, into, into, not translated, I can't say, it was written in English, <laughs> when, when the, it was originally published in the UK, when the US edition came out, Newsweek jumped on it, and they did a five-page cover story. And uh, two years later, uh, 60 Minutes picked it up, and they did a full segment on it. So it got a lot of publicity. Hasn't made much of a dent in the psychiatric community despite that publicity. The former head of the American Psychiatric Association, after the 60 Minutes segment was aired, wrote a, a press release and, and um, said that 60 Minutes had been irresponsible in airing this segment and that Kirsch's research had been refuted. They didn't say by whom or on what <laughs> basis. Um, 60 Minutes, to their credit, responded by saying, we stick with our story. So, but what happens? I don't get... Um, yes. Yeah, I have to say, my eyes were really opened by the amount of thoroughness, the degree of thoroughness that the 60 Minutes producers of that segment went through. Uh, they would call me on the phone every week or two and say, did you see this new study that came out? What do you say about that? Until they aired the, the story, they, they stayed uh, uh, very much on top of it. So I didn't get that much hostility from the pharmaceutical companies even. I got hostility from two quarters. The psychiatric community, not all psychiatrists, some have been wonderful and supportive, but by and large, the psychiatric community, and not pharmacologists, they're fine with it, psychopharmacologists. I asked why. I asked this, uh, I do research in a lot of areas in, in, that involve, I, I do research on placebo effects, and I do that in a lot of areas. So I've done studies on placebo effects in migraines, placebo effects in uh, irritable bowel syndrome. And um, in irritable bowel syndrome, most, most of the treatments that they have, just about all of the treatments they're using now for irritable bowel syn syndrome, they're not terribly effective. Um, they are a little bit, some of them a little bit better than placebo, but not that much. The story is not that much different, except they tend to be um, not dangerous things. I mean, giving, asking someone to have more fiber and probiotics is a good thing, not a, not a, a, a bad thing. But I, we did uh, two studies on irritable bowel syndrome, looking at the placebo effect, and the principal investigator uh, was the head of gastroenterology at Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, medical center, and I said, asked him, I said, Tony, you know, we come up with these data, and they're very similar to the data that we came up with in, in, in depression, that the placebo seems to be uh, as effective, or close to as effective as, as the medications that are being used uh, to treat IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, but you and your colleagues don't seem at all defensive about it. You're friendly to the data. You listen to it. I've been asked to give a, a keynote address at a pediatric gastroenterology uh, conference, and it was not to debate me. It was because they were interested in the placebo effect and how they might make use of it in the treatment IPS. But my psychiatric colleagues, many of them are so hostile, and I, so I wonder why are you and your colleagues so friendly and receptive to this? And he said, Irv, you know, we have a lot of things that we do. We know that medications for IBS aren't that effective, but we do a lot of other things. And you know, if you were to tell us that colonoscopy didn't do anything, we'd be as hostile as the psychiatrists are. Mm. They don't have anything else. Mm. They got out of the business of doing psychotherapy decades ago. So what are you, their livelihood is being threatened by it. That's all they have. And you know the old saying, if you, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Right. Absolutely. 
I just want to say one thing about 60 Minutes and maybe why the reception was different. The 60 Minutes piece came after the Marsha Angel did the uh, thing in the New York Review of Books. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your book was reviewed, my book was reviewed, and, and Daniel Carlett's book was reviewed. So 60 Minutes did come to me as well. But I'm not in the 60 Minutes. <laughs> and part of the point is there's a little bit of a difference here, I think, that is revealing. So if you look at Irving's work, um, well, first of all, he brings an academic credential to it as well. But one, he's tapping into somewhat of a societal unease about the antidepressants. And two, he's not exactly saying that drugs, if, at least at first glance, that the drugs are doing harm. It's just they're not particularly more effective than, uh, anti, uh, than placebo. And that's sort of a, 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 a questioning of this story that I think is okay. It's not talking about drugs doing harm, it's just they're not that much more effective than placebo. And it became a doorway into sort of questioning this, but it's another step to say, you know, these drugs may be harming people, causing bipolar disorder, that sort of thing. I'm just saying, I think 60 Minutes is great, but even 60 Minutes didn't dare go a step further here, and I think that's part of the, you know, it was, Irving's work was like opening a door to a story, and it was the perfect door to open to this story because it was, um, it didn't focus attention on harm done. It focused on less effective than we might think. And that does open the door to a whole other story, but I think that's why it, it shows how hard it is to open that door is basically what I'm saying, fully open. I have a comment too on that because I, have, I had a friend that was still in the pharmaceutical industry and of course I'm, you're, also my mentors, so I've read all of your work as well. And I asked her at the time, because she was selling a psychiatric drug and also an antidepressant, and I, or an antipsychotic and an antidepressant, and I said, so, you know, how's the company, company going to handle this information that came out? Because, I mean, this has to be devastating. She says, no, actually, it's played right into the company's marketing plan. And I said, why? She said, because now we're coming out with treatment-resistant depression so we can get them to continue taking their antidepressants, but we're going to add on our antipsychotic drug so it actually gives us an avenue to sell our new antipsychotics. Fact. And wasn't it right after that that uh, tre treatment-resistant depression became a diagnosis? Vilify. Yay! Yes. Seroquel, right? Yes, Seroquel. Actually, there is a story that just came out in the press. That's how I found out about it uh, a couple of days ago uh, on treatment-resistant uh, depression and uh, um, people that have been treated unsuccessfully with antidepressants and they have found something that seems to work well for these people who have been resistant to, to antidepressants for all these years and it turns out to be mindfulness. <laughs> no. Between mindfulness and exercise, you really had some equally effective treatment to any drug. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Okay. Batteries up. Between mindfulness and physical exercise, they are equal or better than traditional drug treatments. That's what we're seeing. So. Again, I have no background at all in um, anything medical and certainly nothing about pharmaceutical drugs. But I did read a book recently. It was by a man named Ben Goldacre, and he wrote a book called Bad Pharma. Bad Pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A. And I was listening and I'm thinking, I don't know if I understand this. This doesn't even sound possible. This is what he said. He said that you could basically do a clinical trial that, you know, when someone takes a drug, they take it because it's approved by the FDA to be safe. So that makes sense. So we go to the, take medicine under the assumption that it's been tested. So that sounds pretty good. So he's saying that you can be a, a drug company and do trials and just not count the ones you don't like. So if you do 15, if you do seven trials and you don't like six of them, you could just pick out the one you like, which to me sounds like you would obviously get a skewed result if you kept out the results that you didn't like. Did I understand this correctly? Am I getting this information correct? Do you want to comment on that? Because it sounds like I don't know how anyone can count on something working if you're allowed to kick out whatever trials you don't like. 
Yeah, I, I, will, I will be happy to count, uh, comment on that. And he's absolutely right. And he's right in two ways. One has to do with the FDA criterion for drug approval, the efficacy criterion. Their criterion is there has to be two clinical trials in which the drug has been significantly better than placebo, statistically significantly. Now, in order to get those trials, the drug companies can do as many trials as they want. So they might do seven trials and find two that seem to work. Or they might do eight trials to find the two that are work. The negative trials just aren't counted. They have to be sent to the FDA. The data has to be sent to the FDA. But the FDA criterion is there have to be two showing statistical significance. And it doesn't matter how small the difference is as long as it is statistically significant. Um, so that's one part of it. Uh, the other part of it is in terms of what doctors know, what the public knows, what researchers know when they're trying to put all these clinical trials together and see what they can learn from it. And what happens is that the drug companies publish their successful trials, but publish very few of their unsuccessful trials. 40% of the antidepressant trials conducted by the drug companies in the process of seeking approval from the FDA for their, for, for their antidepressant products were never published. And if you look at the trials, it is clear why they were never published. If you look at the published trials, three out of four show a statistically significant, albeit small, benefit for the antidepressant. If you look at the unpublished trials, only 12% show any statistically significant benefit for the uh, uh, antidepressant drug. They're under no compulsion to publish their, their data, with one exception. One exception is Glasgow-Smith-Klein. Doesn't have to publish them, but it has to make them public. And the reason they have to do it is because they were sued by Elliot Spitzer when he was Attorney General of the state of New York. The state of New York sued Glasgow-Smith-Klein for hiding the data indicating that anti their antidepressant, paroxetine, um, was ineffective as a treatment for depression in children and adolescents. They settled the suit, and as part of the settlement of the suit, they agreed to put all of the data on paroxetine online, the summary data of all their clinical trials, and now they are legally bond bound to do that. And at least you can find it there, they're still not uh, published. And what are um, people going to rely on if you go, you, you go to the medical literature to get your answers? Ben Goldacre, the author that Steve was uh, talking about, has started a campaign uh, to require the pharmaceutical industry to make public the results of all of their clinical trials and has had some success so far uh, with some initiatives by the World Health Organization, among other things. Uh, I would urge you to support uh, that campaign. I believe it's called the All Trials uh, Campaign. One thing on the FDA approval, uh, in some ways they don't even need two, really. If you look at the Zoloft trials, there was one that was effective out of six, and the second one was they could find one dosage that was sort of, and if you look at the, the discussion, they're like, well, this isn't a very good standard, but it's what our standard is, so maybe we should pass it. I mean, it's really, it's a lax to, to, to one. The thing that I think the American public misunderstand about the FDA, the FDA is not charged to determine whether these drugs are good for you. Right. Or good for the market. The question is, are they safe enough in the, in the regard they're not going to kill you? And then the other risks are supposed to, or at least kill you in any great numbers. And then other than that, you're just, the, the FDA is to warn of risks. They're not assessing, you know, whether those risks outweigh the benefits. So when they say safe, it just means safe 
in the sense that you're not killing people and the other risks are warned about. And then effective is just, as you said, it's, a, it's an artificial effectiveness. It's like sort of two studies. And I say sort of because you see some bending on that. And you can have six or eight. And if you listen to the discussion, when you see some of these trials where they submitted six studies and four were failed, they basically say, that's our standard. In other words, it doesn't really mean that the drug has proven to be uh, you know, effective. In, in what you mean by a scientific term, it means it meant a legal hurdle for approval, which is a very different thing. We do not have an agency that assesses whether a new drug is, on the whole, the benefits outweigh the risks. There's something else you should be aware of when it comes to the FDA, and that is its source of funding. Do you know what uh, accounts for 40 percent of the funding of the FDA? direct money from the pharmaceutical industry. That's a change that first came into uh, effect under um, Bush the Elder, uh, his administration. And a law was passed. Before that, it was not allowed. There was no pharmaceutical, direct pharmaceutical funding of the FDA. A law was passed to permit mm -hmm. pharmaceutical funding <coughs> for the FDA, and the law said, among other things, that this money could be used only to speed up the approval process. It could not be used for safety uh, uh, monitoring. There was an article on this a few years back in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, in which, in a, I believe it was an editorial, actually, complaining about the shift in the tone at the FDA since this, uh, over the period of time since this, change in what was allowed in the way of pharmaceutical funding uh, came into being. And uh, there was testimony from one fellow who was told by his superior at the FDA that he, he was admonished that, well, you know the drug companies, they're our clients. And the subordinate said, well, gee, I thought the American public were our clients. Mm -hmm. And that's a shift, and that may give you some uh, inkling of the current FDA stance towards drug approval. I'd like to add to that from my experience as well, and that is that, when, again, when I was training and, and we would go, I, I was a hospital rep and a specialty rep, so I very frequently got to work the conferences, which was supposed to be a privilege, but it was actually extra work. And so they would always make you mimic and parrot the company's byline so that you knew exactly what you were supposed to say, just in case that random FDA agent was somewhere coming by to talk to you and trying to catch you in, you know, some illegal statement. And so that was the way that I was being trained in 1985 when I started in the pharmaceutical industry. And by the time this new relationship of the good old boys came to pass, I started witnessing that now they were no longer being referred to as our watchdogs. I was attending meetings where they would talk about our people in the FDA. And I would be like, wait a minute, we have people that work in the FDA? Oh no, you know what we mean, our friends in the FDA, they're going to take care of it for us. So they went from being supposedly the people that were going to be our watchdogs and were calling us on the carpet and keeping us, you know, legally upright to being the people that we were actually cohorting with and, and you know, colluding with. And they were, they had a good old boys network that you found that many of the people, once they retired from the FDA, they actually came into pharma as consultants because of their relationships. So just to clarify, if my doctor, who's a very smart guy and a very good guy who only wants to do the right thing, but he is quite busy, so when he does research, he reads medical journals, and um, if these medical journals are only publishing the articles that are, um, the, the studies that are selected, they're not publishing all, just selected ones that are the best, the best studies, and even the best studies, even if they came out good, they might have only been a six to 12 week study, we don't know what happens over five years, then my doctor's making all these recommendations based on information he's reading in a medical journal that might have the two studies but leaves out the other seven. So how, do, how could I feel certain or even confident or comfortable at all that he has accurate information, even though he's got the best of intentions, why would I think that he has accurate information to recommend 
any kind of drug to me if his information is so apparently skewed. It's worse than that. Mm -hmm. It's worse than that <laughs> because your doctor really doesn't have the time to search through the medical literature. What is your doctor going to do? He or she is going to look at the drug labeling. They still use the PDF, the PDR, the mm -hmm. physician drug reference. Physician's drug reference is a compendium of the labels approved by the FDA. Now what the drug labels will do, in all but one case of antidepressants, there's one exception that I know of, and that's uh, Citalopram, Celexa, where they at least mention the existence of failed trials. The drug labeling says the efficacy of mm Mm -hmm. for the treatment of major depression has been demonstrated in two clinical trials. No mention is made of the drug trials, and that's what your doctor is going to turn to. There was an, a, an official at the FDA, and this is why there's that one exception, uh, selects at the hearing at the, in, the, in the process of approving uh, 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 Selexis, Italopram, wrote a, a memo that is in the FDA files. He wrote a memo saying, uh, actually, I believe that doctors, patients, and third-party funders should be able to know the full data without having to use the Freedom of Information Act and come to us for those data. And I believe further, he said, that um, labeling, which mentions only the positive trials and neglects to even mention the existence of the negative trials, could be construed as potentially false and misleading. I applaud him, and he had asked to get it done, to, to get those negative trials mentioned. They were mentioned and dismissed in the labeling for citalopram. As far as I know, they haven't been mentioned since. Seven trials will be done, two will be positive, five will be negative. The label will say it's been demonstrated in two trials, period. I want to add to that too from my experience, and that is that you can't trust the information that your doctor has unless he is a very diligent researcher and does his own due diligence about everything. And there are very few physicians that have that kind of time or that kind of interest. So what happens is the pharmaceutical reps come in, they take a drug and they go out and they detail the drug and then they come into the home office or they come into these meetings, these pool meetings, district meetings, and they come back and they tell the company what the physician's concerns are. So then when you, the company finds out, okay, for example, this drug has an excessive number of CNS side effects, and so the chart that we're using in our detail piece has a graph that shows that, you know, there's 15 or 20 percent CNS side effects with that. So the next marketing period, when that piece comes out, now they've broken out the CNS side effects into headaches, sleepiness, et cetera, and so forth, so that it minimizes this, and, it, and they, they, they skew it in a way that some statistics become the semantics of research. So it depends on how you present it, on what the interpretation of that data is going to be. And so a lot of doctors depend on those pharmaceutical reps because of their busyness, and they have excellent relationships. Don't get me wrong, you'll have doctors tell you almost all the time, oh well, those pharma reps don't influence what I do, but they don't pay pharma reps the amount of money that they do and give them the benefits and invest all of the, the time and energy that they do in pharma reps if they don't get a good return on pharma reps. In fact, the statistics show that they get 10 times, for every dollar that they invest in a pharma rep, they get 10 times their return. So you have to know these are extremely polished and well-liked people that go in and they know how to influence doctors because not only are they given the data and the sales training, they're, giving, they're given psychological profiling information on how to best influence a doctor's prescribing habits. So you're literally given all the information that you need to go in and get that doctor to do exactly what you want him to do. Now, 
What role do universities or medical schools play? Do they have all the correct, accurate information and tell the doctors perfectly accurate information? Or what, what role? Because I'm under the impression that you know, the medical schools are, have the most accurate information and the universities do the best research. So what, what's the reality? Well, <laughs> you know, medical school is not an entity that has the information. Who has the information? The professors at the medical school, the faculty at, at the medical school. I'm on the staff of a med, uh, a med school, of, a, of a Harvard Medical School. And uh, I mentor students and I mentor, mentor uh, junior researchers and I help plan uh, research. And I, I can't fault Harvard as an institution um, on this at all. I have colleagues who do research that I admire a lot. And the one thing that I do know is that um, the research that is done has to be funded. And it's not funded um, by the university. It's funded by other agencies. And it might be funded, some of it's funded by the National Institute of Health, National Institute of Mental Health, various NIH uh, institutes. Some of it is funded by the drug companies. And the results of the clinical trials seem to vary as a function of who is doing the funding. Here's what, we, here's what we know about that when it comes to antidepressants, which is the area that I am most familiar with. I think this is just anti... Might be, actually, this might be psychotropics in, in general. Um, I have to look that back up again. But with industry-funded trials, now, let's say it's just antidepressants for the moment. With industry-funded trials, 75% uh, of the trials show positive results for the drug that was uh, tested. With independently funded trials, 50% show positive results. That's in, in published trials. Then there are trials that have been funded by a competitor. So this might be a comparator trial, and, and the, the manufacturer of drug A does a trial comparing their drug to a drug of a competit uh, competitor, a different manufacturer. Only 25% of the trials show a positive effect for a drug that is not funded, that's funded by a different, that uh, was funded by a competitor from a trial that's funded by a, a competitor. So who funds the trial seems to have a substantial outcome on the outcome of the trial, at least of the aggregate trials, are the ones that get published. You know, I think this is really an important point. Uh, so, who do we put our faith in as a, uh, as a people? I don't really think we should have faith in the drug companies. And in a way, you know, the drug companies are for-profit companies, and they have an obligation to the shareholders to try to maximize profits, etc. So, I, I, you can understand the, I mean, it's, I'm not going to pardon it, but you can sort of understand the behavior of drug companies. We put our faith in the academic medical schools. That's the group that really is supposed to be beholden to the public and not beholden to the pharmaceutical industry. And a couple of things have happened over the past 30 years. One, we did get something called the Bayh-Dole Act. I think it was 1980, something like that, 1982 which was meant to uh, foster more collaboration between ap academic medical schools and pharma pharmaceutical companies. And one of the, if, I, if I have this act right, before this act, if you were funded by the NIH and you made a discovery, that discovery was seen as part of the public good, okay? So you couldn't license that discovery to an individual drug company because it was funded by the public. But after the Bayh-Dole Act, you could get funding from the NIH, make a discovery, and then the medical school could license that discovery to the pharmaceutical company for development as a drug. And this began fostering this greater collaboration between industry and the academic medical schools. In addition, there was some trouble getting funding. So increasingly during the 80s, NIH funding became harder to obtain, et cetera, that 
academic medical schools look to foster closer collaborations with the medical schools than they had before. And when I was doing that company I mentioned about, pharmaceutical companies noticed this change and they talked about how prior to the mid 1980s or even later, they used to, when they wanted their studies, when they wanted their drugs tested in clinical trials and they needed academic medical people to be authors to lend those studies legitimacy, they would go to the, the academic leaders and they would sort of have to beg, they would say they told me like with hat in hand because the academic medical guys looked down on the drug company funded studies. The real coin of the realm was the NIH studies. But then as a result of the change where academic medical schools now started changing drug money, the power switched to the pharmaceutical companies. And they could go to academic medical schools um, and go to the, 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 the uh, academic professors and they would say take it or leave it now. And one of the things that happened is this power switched. It used to be the doctors, the academic medical doctors, would insist on A, designing the trials, and B, having an ability to actually uh, examine the data and report on the data. Under the new system, that no longer was true. They had to sign off on studies that were designed by the pharmaceutical companies, and they could design it in these biased ways. And they would also analyze the data. And by, as part of the switch, really what you had was the academic medical people, particularly in psychiatry, sort of lending credibility to the studies, but they weren't really doing the studies anymore. It was a, it was a fabrication. And the other thing that happened, particularly in psychiatry, as this switch happened is, the drug companies now began paying uh, academic psychiatrists big, big dollars to be their advisors, consultants, that sort of thing, not just do the trials. Now, the minute they hire academic psychiatrists to be advisors, consultants, speakers, and we're talking big money, under the Charles Grassley probe, you'd, you'd see individual psychiatrists making hundreds of thousands of dollars, $700,000 one person. Joseph Biederman, who helped open up the market for juvenile bi um, Risperdal and juvenile bipolar disorder, got $1.6 million from one company, and I think he worked for about 20 different companies. So the other thing that, he also opened up the ADHD market for, for companies. The point is here, you say we should trust academic medical schools, right? Well, the powers for drug testing, A, shifted to the drug companies. They really gained control. B, medical schools began chasing that money. And C, at least in psychiatry, the profession got bought. Mm -hmm. And by 1998, I think it was, the uh, New England Journal of Medicine tried to find an, a, a prominent academic psychiatrist who could do a review of the data to see are these drugs effective, and they basically had a really difficult time finding anybody who wasn't taking money from pharmaceutical companies. So what happened is we ended up with a compromised, at least in psychiatry, a grossly compromised academic medical community. And in this new book I have, Psychiatry Under the Influence, the corruption actually is in NIMH funded trials, in some instances, I think is much worse than any of the drug industry funded trials. And you say, why is that so? And I think it's two reasons. There's A, guild influences present. They want to preserve that one hammer they have. But two, even though they're not being funded, the investigators at that moment, they're they still have ties to pharmaceutical companies generally as speakers, advisors. So given those ties that may not be present in this individual, tie, individual trial, they're still protecting drug company interests. So this is the big, another big problem we have is the very institution we look for honest information is compromised and corrupted. So, I want to add a little thought. Um, I'm going to take a quiz. How many people are pretty clear from everything that's pre been presented and probably before you came as well that there's a, an immense amount of corruption on every single level? <laughs> okay. So we're kind of speaking to the choir. So I'm going to tell a little story to kind of maybe as we move into c conclusion uh, what to do. So this, this happened in the, in the 17th century. A very, uh, the head of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov, who was 
a great spiritual master, but also a great healer. And he lived in this particular town, Mezibo, and a very famous doctor came to town, and the duchess of the town uh, said, you know, I really want you to meet this healer. And the doctor said, well, what medical school did he go to? No, he didn't go to medical school, he's just a natural healer. So, okay, you insist, I'll meet him. So, the Baal Shem Tov comes over and, um, at the Duchess' request, and the first thing, the doctor, this very famous doctor says, well, what medical school did you come? No, I didn't, I, I learned from God, you know, I, I learned naturally. And then he, a few other derogatory things, well, do you know how to take a pulse? Well, let's see. So I have a very unique pulse. Let's see if you can read my pulse, is what Baal Shem Tov said. And he said, there is something unique, but I can't figure out what it is. He said, well, it's my yearning for God. It disrupts my pulse. Okay. And he says, let me take your pulse now. And Baal Shem Tov is taking his pulse, and he's actually quite a famous pulse taker on many levels. He's reading it, and he says to the Duchess, hey, did you, are you missing a gold a mirror and a silver comb? Yeah, she said, I just noticed that yesterday. He said, well, according to this pulse, if you go to this doctor's room and where he's staying, it's in his trunk. So, of course, she sends her people there, and, of course, the doctor's caught stealing. And he's kicked out of town in disgrace. So, in essence, we're playing out that story again, right? We're talking about fraud, corruption, uh, and actually damaging people. That's what we're talking about. And just a, a, not a small statistic, but more people have died from uh, proper prescribed drugs in the last 10 years than all the people have died in all the wars since the revolution, 1776. 1.3 million people died in all the wars, and about two, th two million, two and a quarter million people die every 10 years from all the deaths from drugs. Okay, this is a pretty big deal. So, I bring the question to you, Baal Shem Tov was pretty clever about it, well, what are we gonna do to expose this system to create some change. Now we can sit here and we're exposing it, right? Mm -hmm. But how do we create some changes in the system that can restore some sort of um, concern for humanity and the healing of humanity? That's, that's really a question. We already agree on the problem. So I want to raise that question if it's okay and see what people have to Ac say. Actually, Dr. Cousins, why don't we take a five-minute stretch break and come back for part two with all four of you, and we'll just stretch and everyone stretch some water, and we'll come back in five minutes for part two.